Power Factor fans, I'm Rick. And uh, in response to an email we got a couple of weeks ago asking about belts, I'm going to talk about belts. Um, we have covered it uh, way early on. We talked in just kind of in our general equipment episodes, like episode one, two, three, maybe. Um, but I just wanted to go into a little more detail uh, because we had uh, interest in belts. And I'm going to divide it up in a number of different ways. Uh, the, the, the first cut is going to be IDPA style belts and USPSA style belts. And the main difference there is per IDPA rules, the gun has to hang on the belt that passes through the belt loops. For USPSA competition, the popular belt is a two-part belt uh, in which uh, you have an inner belt that you wear through the belt loops and then an outer belt that via Velcro uh, attaches to the inner belt. So we're going to start with the, the IDPA style, which is the same style of belt that you wear to hold up your pants. Um, this is a typical belt, leather, it's a single piece of leather, shiny on the outside, uh, rough on the inside, there's no uh, stitching on it. Uh, there's just, uh, this is a one and a half inch wide Bianchi brand belt and it's, it's adequate, but as you can see, it's just, it's a little bit floppy. I mean, even though I have used it as a gun belt, one of the things you want to make sure you have is a belt that's sturdy enough and stiff enough to support your gun. Now I tend to use all metal pistols that weigh 30 to 40 ounces and so you really need a good solid belt to hold up a gun like that and if you're shooting something like a glock 19 it weighs 22 ounces it's not as much of a concern but you want to make sure that your belt fits your belt loops in the sense that if you're using a one and a half inch belt most pants whether they're uh, cargo pants you know tactical pants jeans will accept a one and a half inch belt and that I think is sort of the industry standard I mean just about everybody who's making belts offers a one and a half inch belt um, and uh, this is an adequate belt but it, even though it's made by a company that makes holsters and other shooting equipment, I don't think it's the ideal kind of belt. Now, while we're on the topic of the IDPA belts, we have uh, organic belts like this. This is a leather belt. And then, of course, we also have synthetic belts. Um, I think the most famous one is the Wilderness Instructor Belt. It's very stiff nylon. Um, 511 makes a similar belt. I'm sure other companies do as well. And the advantage of uh, synthetic materials is they're not going to rot if they get wet. Uh, they're not going to mildew like leather will. Um, they just don't require much care. Leather requires a certain amount of care. It'll crack. Um, it'll mildew. You know, they'll, you have to clean it occasionally, treat it occasionally. Uh, synthetics essentially just don't have to mess with that. Uh, now another type of belt, again, going back to the idea that this is a little bit of a flexi flyer, you can use a belt that's made of two thicknesses of leather stitched together. Now this is actually the first competition rig I ever bought. I got this back at, uh, ooh, 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Wow, 20 years ago. This is also a Bianchi brand and it's two pieces of leather. I don't know if the camera is going to be able to pick it up but it's um, two pieces of leather that are stitched together with the smooth side out and the rough side exposed on the inside. And I think to an extent that helps uh, with traction of your gear. If you're sliding your gear on the belt, having rough out on one side helps kind of hold your gear in place. Believe it or not, this is also my first competition holster. I used this in uh, USPSA limited competition for about three years. <laughs> uh, great carry holster, not a great competition holster. This is the famous uh, Bianchi Askins Avenger. But this is a one and three quarter inch belt, I believe. It is. And it's important that, uh, again, go back to your uh, pants need to be able to accommodate uh, the width of the belt. Now, I prefer the one and three quarter inch belt, again, because I'm using a big heavy gun. It helps stabilize the holster. The holster needs to be fitted to the belt. So if you have a bunch of holsters that are inch and a half, have inch and a half slots um, or loops on them, 
get one and a half inch belts, but if I have a choice to supply myself with a new belt, a new holster, I prefer my rigs all uh, in one and three quarter inch width. And of course, then I shop for pants, make sure they'll accommodate a one and three quarter inch belt. Not all will. Most, again, like jeans, tactical pants will, but uh, don't don't buy a bunch of pants with one and a half inch loops and then get a one and three quarter inch belt. So this, this belt is a little bit stiffer. I mean, I think the double, um, the double thickness of leather, it's not, the belt isn't thicker, but it's two uh, thin pieces of leather stitched together and the stitching itself um, adds a little strength to it. So I think the, um, not only the stitching on the edges that holds the two pieces together, but then the decorative stitching also, I think, provides a little bit of extra stiffness. Um, so that's just an alternate, again, leather, but uh, one and three quarter inch thickness and um, uh, the two parts, uh, two pieces of leather stitched together. Now, another one that I like, this is a, again, uh, two pieces of leather stitched together, but it's shiny on both sides. Um, I think it looks good, looks better. It's easier to get it through your belt loops because it's shiny on both sides. I mean, there's just, you know, there's certain considerations that, I mean, you've got to be really concerned about width and thickness and whatnot. But when you're thinking about, uh, like, just like having suede out, I think uh, makes your equipment a little more stable on the belt. If it's shiny on both sides, it just makes it a little easier to put the belt on. So again, this is a fancy stitched belt, two pieces uh, um, stitched face to face so that it's uh, smooth on both sides. And uh, now this is a, that covers essentially your IDPA belts other than I, my not having an example made of synthetic material, it does have to pass through the belt loops, not all of the belt loops. That's another rule change from a few years ago. You're allowed to skip some belt loops. When I went to the store to buy pants, again, because we're gonna have to put that belt through the loops, when IDPA required that the belt pass through all the loops, if you wanted to locate your equipment in a certain place on the belt and a belt loop was in the way, or uh, yeah, your pants loop was in the way, the holster would either have to be farther forward or farther to the rear than you would actually want it to. And the rules dictate how far forward your gear can go. So if you have a uh, kind of an unfortunately located belt loop on your pants, you're either going to have the holster too far forward to be legal, or you'll have to put it behind the belt loop, and then it'll be way further back than you want it to be. So now, happily, IDPA has allowed you to skip some loops. Generally, skipping one on the gun side, skipping one on the mag pouch side is going to be sufficient. But again, buy enough belt, uh, make sure it's long enough, stiff enough, that it fits your pants, and that your holster and your other gear is matched to the width of that belt. Now, the, for USPSA, the popular setup now is a two-part belt, and that utilizes Velcro to attach an inner and outer belt. The inner belt is the one that's holding your pants up. You put it through the loops, and then your gear is semi-permanently attached to the outer belt. So here's an example of a Safari Land rig. This was state of the art maybe uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it has, there not much has changed. I mean, some companies uh, really, the only real difference now is that companies have come up with their own proprietary means of locking the gear onto the belt. Um, this rig, this holster is still available, I think. This is the Safari Land 010, and these holsters, these pouches are 771 or something. And they just, you put them on and you tighten a screw and it holds them in place. And the nice thing about the two part belt is you wear this to hold your pants up, and then you can lock all of your gear onto this outer belt, get it perfectly positioned the way you like it, and then by tightening the screws or whatever the attachment point uh, method is, your gear never moves. You just peel it off when you're done. When you get to the next match, put it back on, and it's really a great system. And again, most of the modern manufacturers, Safari Land and everybody who's making race gear is making their own version of these two-part belts. The one thing that's kind of interesting is this, this belt has the, we'll call it the sharp side of the Velcro 
on the inner belt. And I've heard some people complain that when they take off the outer belt and keep this belt on or to hold their pants up, this can mess up the interior of your car. It's pretty rough, and if you get in, if you've got velour or leather seats, um, this the rough part of the uh, Velcro. Um, isn't very gentle on the interior of your car. So while you're driving to or from the range, um, you might consider getting a belt that has the soft side of the Velcro on the outside of the inner belt, just the opposite of this. This has the, the sharp side on the outside of the inner belt, and then the soft side is on the uh, inside of the outer belt, if we can get our inside, outside, soft and sharp. So if you're going to go buy a two-part belt uh, for USPSA competition, I recommend you get one, shop around, get one that does have the soft side um, on the inner belt uh, and the sharp side on the outer belt. And just, of course, you have to endure the history lesson. This is a USPSA rig from the mid-70s. Now this is a two-part uh, two in the sense that it's split leather, stitched together, shiny on both sides. Back in the day, you know, you hear sometimes, you know, that all this, this modern gaming has just gotten out of hand, you know, it's, it's contrary to the principles of the sport. Well, I don't know what the principle of this sport was. The gun is like a gunfighter rig, like you'd see in a John Wayne or Clint Eastwood Western. The gun is riding very low. It's permanently attached to the belt. The belt is not worn on the belt loops at all. You wear it, you know, down low, gunslinger style, you know, below your waist. And so, you know, it's it's essentially, you know, it occupies the same space as a modern rig, but, you know, this is, this is the ultimate in practical gear from the 70s when Ipsit got started. And, you know, today it's not really that much different. I mean, when I wear this, uh, it locates the gun pretty much exactly uh, as my adjustable Safari Land rig does. Um, you can adjust it. There's not a lot of adjustment, you know, for anything other than just the, the tightness of the retention. But uh, things haven't changed that much. If you think about the rake of the gun, um, where you wear it on your belt, um, it's things haven't changed that much and just like guns really the only difference is materials you know modern guns are made out of plastic people put their plastic gun in a plastic holster mounted on a nylon belt instead of putting their steel gun uh, in a leather rig but uh, again in, in, in then the again with your two-part modern USPSA rig kind of the industry standard I think is an inch and a half and, and that will fit you know just about any pants that you're gonna wear to a match um, will be will accommodate the one and a half inch belt so you don't have to be so concerned with that um, I think just about all the the two-part belt systems are inch and a half so that kind of covers the gamut um, if you're shooting IDPA you have to be a little more concerned about uh, matching your gear to make sure your belt your holster your pouches and your pants all accommodate that belt uh, of, of whatever your chosen width is I recommend a wider belt for a heavy gun if you're shooting CDP or ESP with a 43 ounce 1911 I'd go for the one and three quarter inch belt um, uh, a lighter gun you can use an inch and a half not a big deal but uh that's about it that's the story on belts if you have any questions go ahead and give us a call hey power factor fans i'm rick and we're here at snoqualmie valley rifle club and uh, we're going to just kind of pick up on some stuff that we started off in earlier episodes uh, you recall we did a little review at least a philosophical review of the camera hammer uh, so we're going to put a few rounds through the old 22 and see how the camera hammer works. As you'll recall, the concept is um, uh, dishing out the face of the hammer so that the uh, leverage that the slide exerts over the hammer as it runs back and recoil is essentially magnified from the a stock gun with a flat face on the hammer. So what I've got uh, is my 22 rimfire conversion and I'm running a 14 pound recoil spring which is the spring that I would normally use in a 45 shooting competition loads and uh, I normally run an 11 pound spring in this gun because it is a 22 and we've got limited uh, recoil energy uh, but the effect of the camera hammer should essentially reduce the effectiveness of the springs and we're going to see if I can in fact shoot my 22 with the 14 pound recoil spring in it.
So here we go, camera hammer, first test fire, and this admittedly is a complete test in that I've never used this, never fired the gun with this hammer, and again, I normally use an 11 pound recoil spring. So we're testing uh, the effectiveness on the hammer in increasing the leverage of the slide. So here we go. Works great. I'm actually kind of surprised that the thing will uh, cycle. I, I brought my 11 pound spring with me um, just in case it didn't work, but boy, that works nice. And um, again, the old Colt uh, conversion units and ACEs, uh, one of the things, the issues with them uh, running reliably is the full metal slide. Uh, most modern conversion units either use an aluminum slide or they've got a, a, it's a, a, a separate bolt um, that reciprocates while the slide itself, or what appears to be the slide, remains motionless. You can bolt uh, optics and stuff on them. But this one has a full profile steel slide and uh, the fact that it will run with a 14 pound recoil spring uh, suggests that the camera hammer is certainly doing its job. Um, we'll fire a few more rounds. I'm also going to do some chrono today, uh, catch you up on uh, some other chrono stuff. So let's fire a few of these over the chrono, see if that's working. So here we go, again, camera hammer. So the camera hammer, I'd say it's a big success uh, in this application. I think I'm going to go ahead and leave that hammer in there. I was debating whether I should uh, um, keep it in there, go back to the old spur hammer, um, but I kind of like it. I kind of like it. It's kind of fun. So camera hammer in this application, big success. Um, again, got a good drop in, uh, about four pound trigger pull. Uh, I did not have to modify my thumb safety, which is always a possibility whenever you mess with a, uh, the hammer or the sear in a 1911, it can change the fit of the thumb safety, and I didn't have to mess with that. So, um, yeah, success. I think it's pretty cool. So there, there's our uh, road test of the camera hammer, and uh, check it out.